I'm Jeremy Suri. I'm a professor of history and public policy at the University of Texas in Austin. And I study uh, the history of American foreign policy and its contemporary influence upon American policy today. At the moment, the United States has a number of different, often competing policies in the Middle East. On the one hand, we are still pursuing democratization, trying to support uh, what's left of the Arab Spring, the efforts by populations in countries like Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and elsewhere to take control of their societies. At the same time, we're pursuing a policy of nuclear non-proliferation, trying to prevent countries like Iran from acquiring nuclear and at a third level, we're also pursuing a set of policies designed to try to bring peace between Israel and its neighbors. These three sets of policies, peace between Israel and its neighbors, nuclear nonproliferation, and democratization, these often contradict each other in places like Syria today. And so often they produce incoherent day-to-day -day policies for the United States. I think Obama, as President Obama's handling of the crisis in Syria is probably in a in the C or D range. Um, he's failed to articulate a consistent set of American interests, and he has also failed to uh, articulate a policy that can bring people together in support of intervention or support of non-intervention or support of some multilateral solution. Most Americans and most foreigners don't know what the United States intends to accomplish in Syria, and that makes it very hard to pursue successful policy. That said, this is a very, very difficult issue. There are no easy answers, and it's hard to imagine any president doing A-plus a work on Syria right now. My, my argument, and still my belief on North Korea, is that this is a regime unlike any other. This is different from the Middle East. This is a regime that's run basically as a family business, and it's a regime that uses weapons of mass destruction to hold its neighbors hostage. Um, and I believe firmly that this is a regime that would consider using these weapons before it would face its demise. My argument has been not that we should go to war with the North Korean regime, nor seek regime change per se, but that we should eliminate its capacity to directly threaten its neighbors with nuclear capable missiles. And this is something we can do relatively easily when they put up missiles for test firing as they did a number of months ago. We should set a clear line in the sand that says that you are not allowed as a country to threaten your neighbors with nuclear weapons and then put nuclear weapons on missiles ready to be launched in Japan or Seoul or other nearby areas. That would be our preemptive move, would be to stop them from having these weapons ready for use. American options are very constrained because uh, we, first of all, do not have any assets on the ground. And countries like India and Pakistan, as well as Afghanistan, um, have active and effective uh, military units that are able to pursue their interests. Our best option in the region, I believe, is to forge a closer relationship with India, which will play an important role not only as a regional democracy, but also as a source of stability. Historically, the stablest element of that region has been Indian society. It has many internal issues, but the Indian government is not one seeking uh, conquest. It's a government that has many reasons to want to work with the United States. It's probably our best ally. So that, I would think, is our best option, and I would think the history would point to that as well. Many have argued, uh, going back to the 1950s, in fact, that India is an appropriate counterweight to China. And I think there is uh, something to that. I think India is also a potential partner builder with China. If you believe, as I do, in the effectiveness of a balance of power, if you have two regional actors that are reasonably strong and both have good relations with the United States, that could be, provide a source of stability to the region. So I think this actually could be not just a source of balancing against China, but a means of building a greater regional fabric that would hold these countries together in a stable and productive way. Well, there are a lot of lessons to learn from World War I. Uh, the most important one, of course, being the lesson that uh, crises can build upon one another and bring you to a point of war even though you don't intend to go to war. That's a very important lesson for us. But I think the South China Seas today are also very different 
from Europe in the early 20th century. As historians, we study similarity and difference. Two key differences are, first of all, that you do not have a series of internested alliances. You really have one set of alliances in the South China Sea. Those are the alliances that the United States have built. And then you have China as a new actor challenging those alliances. It's different from the set of rival alliances you had in the early 20th century. And second, I think there's a very firm commitment on the part of all the actors to maintain civilian control over military activities and prevent a turn to World War. In this sense, the lessons of World War I have been learned. So I don't fear a major war in Southeast Asia. What I fear are more small wars. I think we're in an era now of tiny wars, tiny conflicts that continue to fester, create a lot of death and a lot of damage. And I think that's what we want to try to control. And I think we need the great powers, the United States, China, India, and other major actors acting firmly together. And we need to find a way to get the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese to work together uh, as well. The visit by the Japanese Prime Minister to the uh, World War II shrine uh, recently was not helpful at all. And we need to do all we can to encourage that sort of activity not to recur.